there now. About seven about seven point four billion now. Seven point four billion. So there's seven point four billion human beings and practically every one of them is walking around with the um, inner desire, which may or may not be expressed openly, but with the inner desire to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a very important announcement to make. I am the center of the universe. <laughs> And you all are meant to facilitate my enjoyment and do what I want. Another time he said mo that most people live life as if it was a drama or a television series or a movie <coughs> in which they are the hero or the heroine. And they think everyone else is meant to play supporting roles to support them as the hero or heroine. And but, but everyone is thinking they're the heroes. <laughs> everyone, everyone's saying, I'm the hero, you should support me. So that, 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 that leads to a lot of conflict because you know one thing, you're not supporting me. And the other thing, but you're supposed to support me, I'm the hero. So this, this false egoism is removed by chanting. We, and, and if one chants and maintains that, that's an offense. Because you're, it's like you're, you're competing with God. You know, he really is the center. And we really are meant to support him. And it, and if we if we analyze our thought process during our japa, of course we have to fight against it. But we will will find that our the distractions are based on on a, a sort of unspoken premise that we're the enjoyers, we're the proprietors, even we're the best friend. <coughs> In the Bhag who who can quote the verse from the Bhagavad Gita that about that we're not the enjoyers, we're not the proprietors, and not the best friend. That's it. That's it. Bhokta Ram Yogi Tapasham Sarvaloka Maheshwara. The one who understands that Krishna Bhokta Ram, he's the enjoyer. Yogi Tapasham, he's the beneficiary of all austerities and penances. Sarvaloka Maheshwaram, he's the proprietor. And he's the best friend of every living entity. Can attain peace. So we're not, everyone wants peace. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, without peace, where is the question of happiness? So everyone wants peace. And, the, and this is the formula for peace, that you accept Krishna as the proprietor, as the enjoyer, and as the best friend. And then we, we can be peaceful, we can chant peacefully. The whole materialistic world is moving under the false egoism of I and mine. But the factual effect of chanting the holy name is to become freed from such misconceptions. It was very liberating. Uh, uh, and Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has written a book called Harinam Chintamani which takes the form of a discussion with Haridas Thakur, and Namacharya Haridas Thakur, and in that book he discusses the Ten Offenses, and he says that uh, by attentive chanting one can 
um, eradicate all the other offenses, and that inattentive chanting will allow the other offenses to continue and even flourish. So that's the main thing to hear. And Srila Prabhupada gave a very beautiful instruction. He said, just try to hear yourself chanting sincerely. It's like a wonderful sutra. Just try to hear yourself chanting sincerely. That should be our, our meditation while we're chanting. <coughs> Hare Krishna. So are there any questions or comments? Yes, Naimisharanya Prabhu. So Maharaj, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada states that hearing of the holy name gradually promotes one to the stage of hearing about his form attributes as half times. So the question which came to my mind was by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, we already have descriptions of the, the form, the attributes, and the past times. Well, the we need taste. I mean, we distribute books. We're meant to distribute books. Uh, but when people get the books, they don't always read them. But if they if they hear the holy name and their hearts become somewhat purified, then they can uh, awaken some interest in the Lord's, you know, uh, <coughs> qualities and pastimes and so on. I mean, that's an interesting point. It also struck me. But that's, that's how I understood it. Any other questions or comments? Yes, David Arshad Prabhu. Um, so, how should we chant a poem? It's a, it's a long, it's a very open question, but what should we do while chanting so we can try to hear this chant sincerely? Well, the first thing is to get up early. That makes a big difference. The prerequisite for getting up early is taking rest early. I said something similar, but otherwise I've heard that Kalakanta Prabhu at the Krishna house in Gainesville says that, you know, the best advice he can give a person to enhance his spiritual life is to take rest early. If they take rest early, they can get up early, then they can chant and perform their spiritual duties early. And it's, of course, I mean, Srila Prabhupada arranged a morning program like that, that it begins at 4.30, which means you have to get up at latest by 4.00. <coughs> And, and and chant during the Brahma Muhurta. And that's also known in uh, other traditions. Uh, when I was based in Juhu, I had some, fr made friendship with some Muslims. They actually used to come to the Juhu temple early in the morning to pray. And they said, according to their scripture or tradition, God hears their prayers more if they pray before sunrise. And I've, this, so that in any 
like uh, in mystical tradition, even in Jewish tradition, I'm sure in Christian tradition, you get up early in the morning. So that would be the first thing. Then it's highly recommended to chant in front of Tulsi. Do you have Tulsi at home? Yeah. Chanting in front of Tulsi is highly recommended. Namacharya Haridas Thakur did it. And then it's also recommended to chant with other serious chanters. So, no problem, right, Rasarani Mataji? <laughs> no problem on that score. Um, yeah. And, you know, no, yeah, before other things, um, other things like, you know, whatever, emails and. Um, yeah, I, I think that's basically it. Do your children join you? Radhika? <laughs> But anyway, it doesn't, you set the example, you set the example. And yeah, when you can, come to the temple early. In, um, I think in Chopati they have that, that everyone should come, like on Sunday, should come like for Mangal Arti and spend the day at the temple. And when you do that, when you like get that taste, then it's like easier to try to um, replicate it at home. During the week. Yes, sir. Oh, there's a real nice one, which I didn't experience personally, but uh, it was told very uh, vividly by my god brother Tejas Das. So Srila Prabhupada was in Hyderabad, and at the Hyderabad farm, there were three devotees who were very, they, they were sort of all in charge. I mean, they were together, they were in charge. And they're very strong-willed and, and opinionated. And Tejas told me that Srila Prabhupada actually said that they should all meet together fight like cats and dogs, and then when they all agree, they should go ahead. So one day there was some, like, um, was differences between them, and I think, like, independently, they went to see Srila Prabhupada. Uh, and then when they got there, they, they saw, oh, you're also here. <laughs> But the real point is that when that Srila Prabhupada was in like such a, a deep mood of chanting japa, the way Tejas described it, it's like he was relishing some nectar. I mean, like, like you just see his relishing, and Tejas is describing, you could like hear his, his beads clacking and his bead bag. And it's like the whole room was permeated by his chanting. And then they all, like just being in Prabhupada's presence, they all calmed down. And they also started, you know, took out their beads and started to chant. 
And um, yeah, Prabhupada didn't have to say anything about their dispute. And then he might have said something like at the end, you know, if you, if you just chant the holy name like this, all your problems will be solved, something like that. So, I mean, of course, I've, I had my experiences in Juhu, but the one that comes to mind, would it would take a while to tell. So I don't think we'll do that right now. But I see Dave Darshan is holding my books. And this is pure coincidence. That story is actually told in one of those books. So... <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll start with, so this is the first one, Watering the Seed. And this has, it, it has, you know, Srila Prabhupada's teachings and also has a lot of um, uh, anecdotes of my interactions with him. And that story, there, that there's one piece in here called Srila Prabhupada's Faith in the Holy Name. So that story, which is a little too long for me to tell now, comes there. But there was one, one anecdote in here about the importance of chanting 16 rounds. So we were traveling with Srila Prabhupada in India. This was before we had any of our centers. And somehow, it was very rare in those days, but somehow, uh, uh, I don't know if it's American or, or English, but a, a, a European found us, a European young man, he found us and joined us while we were traveling. And yeah, we used to, we would, you know, sit down on the floor, on the ground, have prasad, and he kept saying, you know, Krishna is definitely merciful because, you know, he's giving me this nice prasad every day. So anyway, this young man asked Srila Prabhupada um, that Suppose it's, it's late at night and someone comes who, who, who could become a life member, but we still have rounds to chant. So is it more important to make the man a life member and not finish one's rounds, or should one finish one's rounds and miss the chance of making the, the member? So, of course, the implication was that one or the other, I mean, he, he, could, he could make the man a life member and stay up and finish his rounds. And Srila Prabhupada detected that. So Srila Prabhupada said, um, anyway, so coming to the more, like, more philosophical point. The, the, the young man was saying, why do, you know, if all service is absolute, I think if all service is absolute, why do we have to chant 16 rounds? And Srila Prabhupada, he, he didn't usually do this, but he, he really assert, eventually, after his discussion, he eventually asserted himself and he said, because the Supreme Personality of God had wants you to chant 16 rounds. And he said, you're, 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 you're very attached to sleeping. That was the, you're very attached to sleeping. He said, you can eat and sleep all day long, but you must chant. 16 rounds. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, but said to all the other devotees, but this is 
a special prerogative just for him. That's not for you all. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so there's so water in the seed. Then many moons. This is uh, uh, reflections on departed Vaishnavas. Uh, so there's uh, Jayananda Prabhu, his only as Gargovinda Swami, his only as Krishna Goswami, Sridhar Swami, Bhakti Tirtha Swami, Bhakti Sridhamadar Swami. And then there are three uh, grand disciples included uh, Mother Archa Vigraha, Mother Kirtida, who left her body here in Dallas and a devotee named Abhiram Thakur, who actually became a devotee in Pakistan. And uh, he, he eventually came to India. It, it, it really became very bad for Hindus in Pakistan at one stage. So he, he, he came to India. And... Um, yeah, he was, he was a very nice, wonderful devotee. He, uh, anyway, I could say I could say a lot about him, uh, and, and, and I do in this book. So if you <laughs> if you want to know more about him, you can read about him. But he was really he was an ideal grihastha, and later he was an ideal vanaprastha. He joined the Chopati temple. And he was, he was like, you know, all the young boys there, young men, he was like a mother to them. He would really take care of them. He was a good cook, Bengali cook, and he would cook for them. And then life's final exam, there's a, I think Bengali, saying bhajan koro, sadhan koro. Basically it says whatever sadhan and bhajan you do, it's all very good, but it will be tested at the time of death. And uh, so that's like life's final exam. Whatever we're doing, we're preparing for the final exam. Um, is, is holding this Bhakti Tirtha Swami gave a, uh, a talk in Juhu in which he was saying that Krishna keeps testing us. First he said that there were some educational systems based on the premise of like um, awakening the children's natural curiosity about the world and their natural interest to learn things, and they didn't believe in giving exams. But he said that all those experiments failed. They found that without testing the students, they didn't really learn much. So he's saying that we are, we are also tested, and the test is always, are we going to remember Krishna or forget him? And yeah, and, and like Srila Prabhupada said of himself, first Krishna tested me by taking away everything, and then he tested me by giving me everything. And so, and so Bhakti just said that, you know, we always have these tests, and the, the ultimate tests are we going to remember Krishna or not. Which, in other words, means are we going to seek shelter in Krishna, seek shelter elsewhere. And then he said, and the final test is, is the time of death. That's what it's all leading up to. So that's life's final exam. And there's a lot in here about death. Everyone faces this exam. And before we face it personally, we usually... Um, deal with it when loved ones or family members leave their bodies. 
So there's, uh, it's very useful. I think of all the books, I mean, definitely this one is, it's designed to be read by anyone. They don't have to be devotees. The other two are, I mean, everyone can benefit, but it's more, they're more accessible to devotees. But this, the topic, the treatment of the topic, the, the language is really accessible to anyone. Can give it to anyone who might be facing that, facing challenges related to death and dying. And I've heard from many people who were not devotees who got the book that they were helped very much by it, and some even said they wish they'd had it earlier. <coughs> so these are the three books, and if you buy any of them or all of them, I'll, I'll sign yeah. them for you tonight. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah.